Thanks, Fred. So, uh, how's everybody? Hey, uh, Congressman, sit down. You're, right. <laughs> you've just, he's just flown in from Helsinki. Uh, boy, are his arms tired. I wanted to thank Fred for uh, putting a, a transgenic carnation here. And if you go back in the literature, you'll find the first publication on transforming our genetically engineering car carnation was from Randy Woodson's lab. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I put my glasses on, I saw it, it had a, a little hologram in the middle that jumped out that says, more money, Chancellor. <laughs> Fred is so creative, you know, in the way. Um, but it, it's great to be with you today. And also, as another street cred, um, I was a PI on IGERT uh, at Purdue. I was a co-PI uh, with Marie Thurston on, uh, and I, I was leading the Biotechnology Center at Purdue, and she was a uh, um, director of the MBA program, and we joined forces to create an IGERT that brought together our PhD students in biotechnology with MBA students. Uh, to re it was in the early days of, you know, businesses really building business plans around this technology. Uh, and it was a great experience because I got to know wonderful faculty in the business school. That they're still wonderful. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. So uh, this is a great topic, though. And it's uh, hugely important for the continued success of our country that we focus on graduate education. And in particular, we focus on emerging opportunities in interdisciplinary graduate education. And I applaud NSF for many years uh, helping universities think about uh, how to create innovation in our graduate schools around uh, these sort of programs. And, but you know, at the end of the day, and I know this, you can talk about top down and all of the things that administrators like us you know, live and breathe by, but it, at the end of the day, it only works if the faculty make it work. And, and so that's why having all of you here to take back uh, what you learn and, and create innovation on your campuses is so critical and it has been critical for us. Well, so I, I get the pleasure, you know, they always bring the chancellor in to introduce the congressman. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's what I'm here to do. Um, and it is a pleasure to introduce Congressman David Price. He's my congressman. He's a congressman of a number of us in this room. He's been in that position for more years than, than he cares to remember sometimes. But uh, the other thing about Congressman Price is he's an academic at heart. Uh, his undergraduate degree is from another university in the state of North Carolina, uh, light blue, uh, Carolina, and he went on to, to Yale and earned his PhD, taught for a while at Duke, uh, and then joined uh, the mayhem that we call Congress. And uh, he leads with uh, integrity, and, um, and also he's a strong advocate for science. And... Uh, and so I, I always count on um, Congressman Price leading the effort among his colleagues to really think about the funding for National Science Foundation, for NIH, for the agencies that are important to all of us, but also for advocating for science policy that's sound for our country. Um, we still believe in science, and Congressman Price does as well. Also joining us on the panel, Steve Briggs. Steve, raise your hand. Uh, joined NC State's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, just this past year. Uh, it's almost a year that he's been the launch director for our Plant Sciences Initiative, which is an interdisciplinary effort to bring faculty across campus together uh, to solve some of the most vexing problems in plant sciences. And, and we're, in addition to investing in faculty in that area, we're uh, building a really phenomenal building that uh, Steve has the joy of trying to make sure that everybody's happy. Uh, he, he comes to NC State. Most recently, he was the Senior Vice President of Agronomy and Corporate Marketing for the South Dakota Wheat Growers. Uh, but his background is, is in big agriculture. He's got his undergraduate degree in forest entomology from Michigan Tech and a master's degree in entomology from Virginia Tech. And he's worked in supporting commodity groups and others across our country for many years. And Dr. Corey Scott, uh, Corey, raise your hand. 
uh, is a principal nutrition scientist with Cargill in Minneapolis. Previously, Dr. Scott worked for Lipid Nutrition BV, BV in the Netherlands as a global nutrition manager and for General Mills as a researcher studying vegetable intake, phytochemicals, and human health. Dr. Scott holds a bachelor's degree from UNC Chapel Hill. What is the deal here? I mean, <laughs> it's a fine institution. Um, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, a master's degree for uh, another great state university and a partner with ours in agriculture, North Carolina A&T uh, University, and a PhD in food science and nutrition from the Ohio State University. <laughs> Uh, and Ms. Maggie Monest, uh, Maggie, if you will uh, gently wave to the crowd, is a senior manager for the Agricultural Sustainability Program at the Environmental Defense Fund, where she works with farmers, food companies, and agriculture organizations to create an agriculture system dedicated to climate stability, clean water, and food security. She received her bachelor's degree in political science and economics from Tufts University and a master's uh, in environmental management from Duke. Uh, and finally, Dr. Cheryl Kanikas. Uh, Cheryl uh, is the director of the USDA uh, Office of Pest Management Policy, where she represents the USDA in FIFRA, or the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rod Rodenticide Act. I thought I should say that, just to prove to Fred I actually know those words, uh, and serves as the USDA representative on the Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee. During her career, uh, Dr. Konexis has uh, served on the White House Council on Environmental Quality as Director of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, Remote Sensing Laboratories, and Acting Director of the Office of the Chief Scientist. Uh, she has a bachelor's and master's degree in soil science and agronomy from Brigham Young and a PhD in soil sciences from NC State. Uh, so thank all of you for participation, your participation. I apologize for taking so much time. You're off and running. All right. What else do I need to do, Fred? I mean, have I, have I nailed it? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So in that order? Yep. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good morning. It is, uh, it's good to be here and good to be back uh, at NC State and to be uh, part of um, an ongoing discussion. I feel like I'm being airdropped into a, to a well-advanced discussion here, and what I have to say may or may not be uh, relevant and useful. Uh, but I uh, am glad, nonetheless, to, to be part of this, and uh, we'll look forward to the discussion afterwards. I'll try to lay down a few benchmarks that might be suggestive in terms of, uh, of the role of, uh, of government in, uh, in this uh, field of graduate education and the uh, possibly catalytic efforts to uh, encourage interdisciplinary work. Uh, I want to reflect a bit on interdisciplinary work itself and what it seems to me some of the useful dimensions are. And then maybe a word about <coughs> the, uh, the financing of, uh, of educational uh, opportunity, not just on the research front, but also uh, the, uh, the efforts to rewrite the Higher Education Act. I'll do all that very briefly, but uh, we'll uh, look forward to discussing anything that you want to, uh, to take further. Most uh, graduate um, education these days, of course, is, uh, is not funded directly through, through fellowships and, and, and grants. It's, uh, it is a, it is a uh, uh, the, the result of, uh, of research funding, research grants that go to inst institutions that in turn support uh, graduate students. The number of uh, direct fellowships uh, is, uh, is much, much smaller, uh, almost non-existent. My, my son actually had a Javits fellowship, believe it or not. Do those even still exist? I don't think so. You're, uh, no recognition. So uh, <laughs> this was a uh, this was an NSF administered fellowship, which took him through a couple of years of graduate school, and it was a great thing. And uh, I, uh, of course, was grateful for it. But uh, I think uh, I think the the, the uh, training grants of the of the sort that we're we're focused on here that uh, that uh, where, whereby NSF encourages interdisciplinary work and um, the kind of augmenting of of graduate education. Those are, uh, those are of course, a welcome uh, innovation, a welcome opportunity. But most of the time, we're talking about uh, research funding and, and the kind of um, uh, 
ups and downs of the, of the research budgets that we've uh, unfortunately become uh, accustomed to. I say that, uh, <clears throat> also need to emphasize though, that usually it has worked out. We've usually had bipartisan budget agreements that um, after months of drama and uh, near-death experiences uh, produce, um, <laughs> produce, uh, produce budgets for the uh, research um, uh, accounts throughout the federal government. But I'm sure I don't need to persuade you that that's a very, very poor way to govern. And even though we're now into this pattern, we've been into this pattern ever since the, the Tea Party dominated Congress of, uh, of 2010, elected in 2010, uh, forced this um, awful Budget Control Act uh, onto uh, the president uh, as the price of um, you know, paying the national debt. Uh, we're now in year seven, I guess, approaching year seven of, of, a, of an interminable 10 years with those budget caps, which uh, have, of course, as a default position, if we don't do the right thing elsewhere in the budget, they have a default position of uh, sequestration levels of funding, which are even worse than the budget caps, and which are uh, literally unworkable. So every year we have to uh, try everything else before we finally do the right thing and do a bipartisan budget agreement and write our, our bills. Uh, so uh, it, it's a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, unsatisfactory uh, way to govern, and it should never be accepted as normal. And I look for the day, anticipate the day, when we do our budgeting on a more rational and predictable uh, and steady uh, basis. Uh, the, uh, the outcome this past year uh, once it came, uh, five months into the fiscal year, the outcome was, was rather positive for research, although there's a price, believe me, you don't need to persuade me that there's a price to be paid for the uncertainty and for the missed deadlines and for the, the kind of uh, failure, the failure to do this in a, in a timely fashion. But at, in the end, the fiscal 18 omnibus appropriations bills produced, uh, just looking at aggregates across, uh, across departments, 177 billion in, in R&D funding. That's an increase of actually almost 13% from the uh, fiscal 2017 level. And um, we can break that down if you want to by agencies. But it affects basically uh, research accounts across uh, the government, all the way from NIH to NSF to the Energy Department to the Ag Department to DARPA. Uh, these research accounts have, uh, have suffered greatly under the regime of sequestration. They have uh, been, unfortunately, pretty, uh, pretty ripe targets for, uh, for indiscriminate budget cutters. And um, it takes that kind of bipartisan budget agreement to put these budgets back together. And as I said, while the, while the outcome at the present has, uh, gives us some, uh, some encouragement, uh, still, the process uh, is, is not satisfactory, and it remains to be seen whether the fiscal 2019 budget will be done any better. Uh, now, secondly, uh, the, uh, the, the encouragement of interdisciplinary work, and, and this, this leads me to some reflections on the needs of government itself, as well as uh, things that come more from my experience in, in the academy. I, uh, I had a dream job at Duke that I was recruited to in the, uh, in the early 70s, where, whereby I uh, got a job in political science, my, my home discipline, but also was part of a, a young faculty group without too much adult supervision, uh, starting what's now the Sanford School of Public Policy. So I was director of graduate studies in political science and saw a lot of graduate students through, um, through, the, uh, through the process there. And then I, uh, in, especially in public policy, uh, had a, had a role that was just inherently uh, interdisciplinary. Public policy itself is an interdisciplinary discipline. And uh, the new model public policy schools, like the Kennedy School, and, and Duke was, uh, was a, a sister institution, uh, the core discipline is, is economics, but uh, there's basically a, an attempt to integrate uh, uh, political science and history and, and other, other fields into a, a well-rounded uh, education for policymakers that, uh, of course, uh, is, is analytical in its character, but understands that analysis proceeds from a number of disciplinary bases. Now, my job, Joel Fleischman was our uh, first director, and Joel, uh, coming off of the Watergate experience, uh, knew that, um, that uh, our program had to have an ethics component, simply had to have an ethics component. It was not, it was not 
at all clear what that would look like. Well, just most basically, would it be about the ethics of the uh, of the office holder, of the bureaucrat, of the of the individual, and the way that uh, one's personal ethical standards might need to be adapted or modified? That there's a whole line of uh, of political theory that uh, deals with that question, at, at least as far back as uh, Machiavelli. Uh, on the other hand, you might uh, you might say this is about policy analysis. This is about the inherited concepts. Here you access political philosophy and theology. The, the inherited concepts we have of the good society, a just society, community, liberty, the public interest, all of those are terms that have a history, that have a meaning. They do not mean the same thing. And in policy debates, they may or may not uh, lead to a, uh, a single result. But uh, certainly debate is enriched if you uh, carry it out with a, a, an awareness of those historical traditions. Well, that's the, that's the uh, model of ethics that we settled on as appropriate to graduate education, or especially important to graduate education. But um, th these are really useful discussions uh, to have, I think. I, uh, I, I wish I had uh, asked the chancellor uh, before I started. I remember a discussion here at NC State uh, when um, in a previous, it may have been a previous administration, may have been when Randy was first here, but some, uh, there was a great emphasis on pulling together interdisciplinary teams in, in various fields, and then the university had some university-wide appointments that could be uh, used to augment these, these interdisciplinary fields. And I remember one in particular where, uh, where the team came up with, with what? With ethics. With ethics as the place where that additional appointment, that university-wide appointment, was most needed. I, I, that, of course, uh, I thought was a, a wonderful idea. And there are so many fields where, uh, where that actually is indicated, where, uh, where the ethical dilemmas that we're wrestling with are so, so difficult and so profound and so uh, un, unexplored that, that we simply must uh, have an integrated approach uh, to, uh, to, to understand the, the, the implications of what we're, uh, what we're studying. Uh, to say nothing of, of, of more conventional interdisciplinary uh, Inter inter intersections. And uh, so the fact that the National Science Foundation in encourages this kind of work and, uh, and incentivizes it, I think, is, uh, is very, very uh, important. I, I've been thinking about this lately because um, its, uh, it's implications, the, the need to talk to each other and to understand the relevance and the intersections of the things we study and read and think about, this, uh, this really uh, goes beyond graduate education. If I if, if I may say so. Um, you ask yourself, and this is, um, to, to put it this way, is, is pretty discouraging, I guess, but, but you ask yourself, what, um, what would a really adequate civic education look like these days? Wouldn't there need to be some understanding, let's say, of countercyclical uh, economics, of Keynesian economics, or other theories of, uh, of, of uh, of how uh, e economies work, and particularly how economies in distress get um, get uh, rescued, wouldn't there need to be some understanding of uh, collective action, the, the theories of collective goods, and how collective goods are are, are realized in uh, in complex uh, social situations? Yes, I think so. I think so. Uh, I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago to the political science graduates of um, of, of the other institution. And I, uh, I gave them a very short uh, account of the, of the tragedy of the commons and, and, and of um, uh, Jane Mansbridge, the APSA, American Political Science Association president's uh, thoughts along, along the lines of, uh, of, of the kind of education a, a political scientist really ought to receive. And um, uh, faculty um, members afterwards, uh, were, we were talking and said, well, wonder how many, uh, how many of those political science majors knew what you were talking about? Wonder, wonder how much of, of exposure to these basic uh, theories and ideas of how the world works, wonder how much is incorporated into their education. Um, to say nothing of, of, of liberal arts generally, when I, when I think about, uh, when I think about uh, my, my work and, and what uh, I reflect on, it really, it really would not necessarily be the the most instrumental kinds of training I've had over the years. It, it might be some, 
some some history, some 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 understanding that one gets from let's say reading not just the Federalists but the Anti-Federalists, and the kind of uh, attitudes and views about government that have been a part of the American heritage for for uh, all these these years. It help us understand our, our current situation, or the or the perennial debate between liberal individualism and and communal responsibility. Uh, let alone the, the, the tragic reflections of uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, second inaugural. You know, it, we, we really need, I think, to, uh, to stop apologizing about the liberal arts and start understanding the way a liberal arts education is, uh, yes, of course, it, it promotes creativity, it promotes critical thinking, it promotes lots of uh, abilities that have to do with whatever one does in life. But it also has to do with uh, self and societal uh, understanding. So I'm, uh, I'm very high on interdisciplinary training. And uh, obviously, in thinking of it this way, you're, you're thinking maybe impossibly uh, broadly in terms of, uh, of what specific uh, traineeships or specific programs might encourage. But I, I do believe that uh, the academy needs to be infused with uh, an appreciation of what each other do and a determination that the broader context of what we do, the historical uh, antecedents, the social implications, that this needs to be on our minds, especially as we train students going out into the, into the workplace. It will make them um, better, it, it'll make them better at whatever they do. It will also sensitize them to the, uh, to the larger importance uh, and, and the responsibility that uh, accompanies whatever roles uh, they play. So uh, to, to, uh, to whatever extent we can um, build this in, and I realize it goes beyond the scope of this conference, but to whatever extent we can build in this kind of uh, uh, instinctive interdisciplinary reaching out, and, and I know it isn't instinctive, quite the opposite, but I, I, think, I think things have changed, and I certainly I certainly witnessed, as a professor of uh, public policy teaching ethics, I witnessed not only public policy students, but engineering students, medical students, students from all over the university coming in to uh, gain some appreciation of, of public policy, not just ethics, but public policy in general. And they, uh, they saw, they understood that that engineering career would have uh, many, many more possibilities if they also had a training in, in law or in, or in uh, public policy. And uh, I trust their careers have worked out that way because we certainly depend on that and will increasingly depend on it in, in, in government and in other fields, people who have broad training and broad understanding. Um, finally, uh, all of this is, uh, is on, the, on the line as we uh, um, consider the uh, I would say ill-advised uh, so-called uh, Prosper Act in the uh, in in the in the Congress. Uh, we uh, have uh, proposals before us to uh, to march back down the hill. I would say with respect to, to student loans and the and the kind of flexibility that we had gotten some di distance toward uh, achieving. You know, in the last uh, administration, we now uh, we're now not even sure we'll have. Uh, that degree of flexibility in student loans uh, going forward. We have ill-advised caps on how much a student can borrow for graduate or professional school. Uh, we have uh, prohibitions against graduate students being part of uh, work-study programs. I, where did all this come from? It sure didn't come from the academy, it's, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a real list of things that would do uh, very serious damage, I think, to uh, to uh, grad graduate education, and so we, we need to do better, and hope we'll be, hopefully we will be in a position to authorize a new and better Higher Education Act uh, in the not too distant future. In the meantime, you know, it's not the worst thing to be without an authorization. It's not a good thing, but if the kind of authorizations that's gonna get written is, is going to set us back, then, uh, then maybe we just go along year to year on the basis of annual appropriations un until, uh, until we can write the the, the kind of uh, Higher Education Act uh, re renewal that will, that will really expand opportunity and uh, take, us, take us forward. Uh, international students, uh, we, uh, we of course uh, have continuing struggles there um, in, in terms of the ability to bring students here, the uh, ability to bring uh, visitors from other countries here, even for panels, for conventions. We, we deal with this in our office uh, 
almost weekly on a on a on a case by case basis, trying to help uh, this slow walking process help break through that with respect to um, to international visitors and international students. It is, I think, part of a broader a broader negative attitude about uh, about uh, immigration and about the the uh, contributions that immigrants uh, or even visitors uh, have to to offer. Uh, here too, we uh, we need to uh, be broadening access, broadening opportunity, uh, and, and, and instead of, of, of the opposite, because uh, we and we're talking not just about the the opportunities available to uh, to individuals, which of course we we want to expand and make uh, accessible, but we're also talking about the the community of uh, of learners, the community of scholars, and the kind of um, enrichment we all. Uh, experience when that is a diverse community, when it's diverse uh, in terms of our American population, but also when it's diverse uh, internationally. So uh, wh whatever our, our goals in higher education uh, might, might be, uh, I think this, uh, this current crisis in affordability and accessibility uh, is, is, is uh, central to, uh, to the policy agenda. With that, I'll stop and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you.